I think people are still joining us, but we'll start quite slowly. So hopefully um, they will catch up as they as they come in. Um, I'm Nigel Di Narona. I'm part of the team presenting. I'll introduce Nisa shortly. Um, so we're talking about a new resource that um, we've made available to you through um, um, the event page, the Evans Teaching data set. Uh, we'll talk more about that afterwards. Um, and uh, it will be available through the UK data service shortly. So what we're going to do is, first of all, have a, a bit of a welcome and introduction. We're going to ask you a few questions about yourselves. Um, we're then, Nisa is then going to talk about the EVEN survey. So this is a, a cut down version of a previous talk. So there is the link there as well if you want more detail about the EVEN survey itself. Um, I'll be doing a session on teaching with Eden's data and thinking about some of the ideas um, of what's there. And at the end, we'll kind of give you the opportunity to come back. But we're going to break in the middle. In the um, but bottom of the bottom, you'll see a Q&A thing. So if you have a question as we're going through, put it in and we will pause at the end of the section um, about the Eden survey so we can clarify any questions about that then. Um, so, on to the interaction. This is over to Nisa. I'll let her introduce herself for, first, and then we'll start moving through um, her presentation. Um, and there's a link here, so the the um, slides will be available on the um, on the event page, so you can go and look at the um, fuller presentation on the Equality for National Survey. Thank you, Nigel, and good morning to you all. It's fantastic to be here with you and to see such diversity and expertise of disciplines and uh, places of employment in the group today. So a very warm welcome to you all. I'm going to take a bit of time now, as Nigel said, to introduce the Evidence for Equality National Survey. And let's start by thinking what's new about EVENS? Why should we be bothered about this new data set that the UK Data Service is supporting us to promote and support the use of? Four key points. So EVENS is the largest and most comprehensive survey of ethnic and religious minorities in the UK. Um, we can say ever and certainly in, in contemporary data. So we have 14,000 participants in the survey around 10,000 of those identify as an ethnic minority. So really large sample size compared to other surveys in the UK. So we have here in this data set, novel data in terms of the topic, which are common onto robust data in terms of the method to present us with a really unique and rich resource for understanding the experiences of minoritized ethnic groups. And one thing to note with EVENS and that you can find out a lot more about in the um, other resources from UK Data Service and the EVENS team is that we use a non-probability survey method for EVENS. I'm not going to go into very much of the detail of that today, uh, but happy to answer questions and uh, there are the other resources to look at if you're interested in that. So we've got this new resource, but why did we want to collect these new data? Why did we want to know about these experiences? And it comes really from my work as a member of the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, working with a fantastic team, um, looking at ethnic inequalities over the last 10 years. And together with others who have been working on racial justice and ethnic inequalities, really became very conscious of the persistence of ethnic inequalities in the UK across social realms and not really much change in that over the course of this work. And this was really enhanced during the pandemic. It became very evident quite early on during that crisis that ethnic minorities were having very distinct experiences from the general population and often worse experiences um, of that pandemic. So we were motivated to collect data to help us understand those distinct experiences and the, the patterns and processes driving ethnic inequalities. So I led the EVENS project with a, with a large team, including James Nazdu and Laya Bakaris, who have argued in other work 
um, that the mortality in areas of high ethnic minority populations were a consequence of social and economic inequalities driven by entrenched structural and institutional racism and racial discrimination. So that's where we as a team within CODE and within the Evens Project were coming from. We're concerned about inequalities. We're concerned about racism. But why a new survey? That's the context. But we were also concerned that the data that existed prior to Evens was deficient for what we wanted to get at in a number of ways. So firstly, social surveys in the UK, wonderfully rich as they are, and I use many of them a lot, do tend to represent quite a limited number of ethnic groups and very broad ethnic groups. So we might be able to say something about the black population. We might be able to say something about the Asian population. But we uh, as scholars and teachers really wanted a bit more nuance and detail in how we were thinking about people's identity. Secondly, existing surveys, because of the way that they are designed and they sample, tend to overrepresent ethnic minorities that live in areas of residential clustering particularly in the southeast, particularly in London. So really, those surveys can't effectively tell us about what's it like to be an ethnic minority in the northeast of England or in, in rural Lincolnshire or in, in the Scottish borders. Um, so we hope to address that deficiency using evens. Thirdly, because this was a survey that was specifically motivated by understanding experiences of minoritized groups, the topics and the questions are really concerned with that. So we have a whole bank of questions in this 30 minute survey that are focused on these issues of inequalities and minoritized experiences. Of course, we can tell something about this from census and administrative data, which have fabulous population covers. And, and for human geographers like me, if you're interested in place, the census is, is such a wonderful resource, but they have limited topic coverage. So we can't know about attitudes, about details of finances, about political positionings, about experiences of racism with the census or indeed with administrative data currently. The final reason why we thought there was a gap in the market, so to speak, for ease, evens was methodological. So working with leading social statisticians at the University of Manchester, we really pioneered this non-probability survey approach um, as a way to try to improve the representation of small and minority populations in survey data. So that's why we produced evens. Um, as a team within CODE, but how did we do it? What did we do to um, get these 14,000 people into the survey? So we used a, a non-probability approach, as I've said, um, with a 30 minute questionnaire, which we developed in collaboration with our partners. And I'm gonna come on to the partnerships later because that was really important part of the approach that we took. Uh, this was available online um, and on the telephone in 14 languages that are listed there. So we tried to be as inclusive as we could with the resources that we had available to us. Um, and it was an open survey. So we didn't approach people and say, and invite them to take part in our survey. This non-probability method just says, if you feel that you're an ethnic minority, come and take part in this survey and tell us about your experiences. So it's an open web link, open invitation survey recruitment method. Um, so there's no inclusion or exclusion based on identification, based on neighbourhood. There was a requirement for residency in England, Wales and Scotland to be eligible, and we gave all participants a voucher of £10 upon completion of the survey. The data were collected during the middle of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, February to October 2021. And we have some original questions in the full questionnaire, uh, plus some that were borrowed from existing surveys, such as the Health Survey for England, ELSA, Understand Society and others. We worked with Ipsos uh, to uh, administer the survey and the whole project received ethical approval, including a number of amendments from the University of Manchester Ethics Panel. So we did set some target quotas by ethnicity, age, sex, and region to um, 
set to maximize our chance of having representativeness of the sample. And we had an initial screening questionnaire uh, to, for eligibility in terms of GB residents. And an important part of this methodology, so we have our targets, target quotas, if you like. We say anybody come and take part, but of course we, we have limited resources to pay this incentive to people. So we can't be open-ended. We can't recruit 50,000 people much as we might like to. Um, so we have to monitor when we reach our target for a certain group uh, and then sort of say to anyone else who comes in, I'm sorry that um, this is this is full. Um, so we were monitoring on a daily basis and on that we were adapting our recruitment approaches. So say we wanted to know more about the experiences of older Bangladeshi people in the northwest of England, we could target our recruitment efforts if we weren't meeting our quotas because we were doing this daily um, monitoring of the responses. And we used some quite advanced um, statistical indicators to help us with that targeted recruitment. So key to this was working with partners. Um, and we had a number of fantastic partners that are listed here aimed really at representing a range of ethnic groups and regions of the UK. So Ethnic Minorities and Youth Support Team in Wales, Friends, Families and Travellers, Stuart Hall Foundation, uh, BEMIS in Scotland, Institute for Jewish Policy Research, NHS Race and Health Observatory, Business in the Community, Muslim Council of Britain, Runnymede Trust, the U Bailey Initiative, Race Equality Foundation, Operation Black Vote and the Migrants Rights Network. So all of these organisations worked with us to promote the survey and recruit to it. And here are some examples of the kinds of advertising and events that we did, the kind of imagery, the kind of branding that we had. So it was it's quite different from a, a, a typical um, survey ap approach where people are sampled from a sampling frame and invited to take part. And you can see at the bottom there, I've given some examples of particularly targeted um, advertising two particular groups, so friends, families and travellers there on the left. Uh, we really do work hard to try and get uh, gypsy, Roma and traveller participants in the survey. And the bottom right there, you see a bespoke advert for uh, Jewish participants. So with the, the partnership with friends, families and travellers, I want to dwell on this a little bit because we took a, what I think is quite an interesting approach to this. Um, so through our monitoring, we saw not unexpectedly, as this is common in, in research and including survey research, that we weren't getting the response we hoped for from Roma or Gypsy traveller populations. And we did some focus groups uh, in collaboration with friends, families and travellers and found that really there were a lot of concerns in the communities around trust, around confidentiality and with digital literacy. So in partnership with FFT, we uh, took a different approach to the recruitment of these participants and we trained community interviewers who then went into communities uh, with digital devices and completed face to face the interviews for evens with people in those communities. Um, and that took part just in a portion of the overall fieldwork time. So in the summer of 2021. And through that, we got 309 participants through that community interviewing method. So for those of you inter interested in survey methods, I think this is something interesting. And for those of you using the data as well, it's just uh, worth being aware uh, in teaching as well that the sampling approach for these groups is slightly different from the overall sample. So let's come to the sample overall. How, how did we do in terms of recruiting people across the groups? Um, well, we, we met on the whole the target populations, which were linked to the, the distribution of the population, the ethnic groups in the population overall. Um, in some groups, we, we exceeded our targets. So, for example, in the Indian group and for other groups, so the Roma, we didn't quite meet our targets, but still we, we were quite pleased with, with how we did. And you can see that there's also a general population sample here, which includes white British, uh, 4,500 here, and that's to enable comparisons um, across the survey sample. These are the unweighted survey sample sizes. I'll say a little bit about weights in a moment. And we can also see the sample broken down into religion, into region and into age group. 
Um, so for those of you who are based in particular parts of the country, it is possible to look in more detail at particular areas. We got pretty good sample in, in Wales, 900, pretty good sample um, in Scotland as well, just over 1100 and across other regions of, of England. Um, on age, the main thing to be aware of in terms of the deficiencies of the sample is the relatively known low numbers in the older ages. So with analyses, we are recommending grouping the older groups into 55 plus because of the, the lower numbers and the distribution of those across the groups in those older ages. So something to work on if we do the survey again, but otherwise the, the distribution of the sample across these key target variables is, is pretty good. I want to say just a little bit about weights, not to get too technical, but what, what the weights do is they enable users of the data to use those um, data as if they are representative of the general population of Britain. So when you're using survey data, you need to apply these weights. You need to tell whatever program you're using to, to use these weights, which it will just run in the background for you. So once you've told it to do it, you don't have to worry about it too much. So we use quite a sophisticated approach to weighting in evens, but the main thing to know for today really is that this accounts for coverage errors. So where we've missed people of a certain region or certain religion or certain age group, we can adjust that to what it should look like in relation to what we know about the population. But we also adjust for selection bias, by which I mean the likelihood of people taking part in a survey uh, because of aspects of their, their life, their, their characteristics. Um, and that we draw on survey research more generally and use some quite sophisticated matching techniques to link um, the Evans data to other data sets to account for that selection bias. So we're fairly confident that we have pretty good weights in there so that you can use Evans to um, make claims about the population of Britain overall. So, it is vital to use uh, weights when using the evens data and um, including for teaching. And you'll see that Nigel has put some comments about that in the, the documentation for the teaching data set. Um, so in the teaching data set, if you just move on the, a slide, Nigel, please. We have two weight variables, um, one called BK weight or book weight. And these are the weights used in the Evans book, which has been published last year. And we include that because, as Nigel will come on to show you, you may very well want to replicate some of the analyses in that book in your teaching or in your work or just as an exercise to check your use of the data. So we include that weight that we used in the book. However, we have also provided updated weights um, since we published the book and they're included in the main data set and also in this teaching data set with the variable name of weight. So for all other analyses, apart from comparison with the book analyses, we recommend that you use the weight variable. The reason why we updated the rate, the weights was because we weren't happy with how we were adjusting for experience of racial discrimination in the adjustments for selection bias. So in sum, what we found was that using the original weights, we were underestimating experiences of racism. So what you'll see in, in the book um, is, which is available as a free ebook, which is, there's a link to that at the end of this, this slide, these slides. Um, it, the figures there on experiences of racism actually underestimate what we think is, is the case. So the full Evans data set has a lot of topics in it. Um, and the ones that are included in the teaching data set are highlighted here in purple. So the teaching data set is a selection of the variables from the main data set. And it draws across many of the topics, but focusing on, on a number of themes that Nigel will come on to talk about. But in the main data set, we have quite a lot of detail on socioeconomic circumstance and financial circumstance and how that changed during the pandemic, which those of you from economics background may be interested in. Um, we have quite a lot on identity, so perhaps uh, sociologists among you will be interested in how people articulate their identity, what they mean by ethnic identity, how it relates to other aspects of identity and belonging. We have housing and demographic 
information in the survey and quite a lot on health and well-being. Uh, Nigel's going to illustrate that a little bit, both mental health and physical health, um, both in terms of diagnoses and in terms of self-reported and self-perceived health. We have questions about Black Lives Matters, about activism, about support for that, questions on social co cohesion and belonging, including belonging to local area, attitudes towards the police, perhaps the criminologists among you will find that interesting, and COVID-19 compliance as, as well um, on a number of measures and a number of compliance initiatives. We have trust in, in government, and we asked about that at, at national, UK reg and regional levels, regional mayoral levels. And then we have quite a big module in the data set on racism and discrimination, and that is included in the teaching data set. Let me say a little bit about those ra that racism and discrimination module. Um, so we have data variables on people being insulted for um, reasons to do with ethnicity, race, colour or religion, damage to property, physical attack, being treated unfairly in a number of social domains, um, racism from neighbours. And then we have worry about being harassed, which I think is a really interesting variable, actually, and some interesting results on that. Um, change in treatment experiences of racism during the pandemic. And then also an interesting question shown here on the right hand side, how did people respond to experiences of discrimination or unfair treatment? Another feature of the data worth noting that's in the main data set that we won't linger on too much today is that we, we asked people when they had these experiences of racism. Was it very recently or was it long ago? So in that sense, we can sort of begin to construct a life course history of experiences of racism, even though this is a, a cross-sectional data set, a data set that's just recording people's experiences at one point in time. So there's loads you can do with the data. Um, both in teaching and in, in research. And this is just a few examples of things that the Evans and Code team are working on at the moment. So life course experiences of racism across ethnic groups, connections between racism experiences and loneliness, um, the protective effect of religion for loneliness during the pandemic, social connectedness and loneliness, prevalence of mental disorders during the pandemic by ethnic groups, local, local belonging and ethnicity, articulations of ethnic identity and how we can think about official ethnic group categories, political trust uh, across ethnic groups and whether it's and how this is related to compliance with COVID-19 measures and methodological papers on producing this non-probability survey. And you can find out a bit about that I've already referred to, which is available free as an ebook. Um, you can also buy it as well if you like, um, if you want the lovely hard copy, but you can get it instantly from the Policy Press website and also find out more about it from the Evans web pages on the, the code website. And this has lots of thematic chapters covering lots of the topics um, that I've just mentioned. So that was a, a relatively brief um, coverage of what Evens is about and how we came to do it and something about the survey overall. And I think we're going to pause here um, to just check some of the questions. Which OK, I think we're going to stop the questions there, but keep them coming and we'll pick up again at the end of this. And thanks very much for that um, interesting session. So I'm going to move on to talking about the teaching data set now. So. Just to say, first of all, this will be available. It will include the teaching data set. So this is has around 67 variables, I think, around that. Um, it's open access. So if you're used to using UK data service data, um, you will know that a lot of our surveys are um, safeguarded, but we do produce open access versions to support teaching um, and to support other, other uses. Um, there's a data dictionary which gives you a guide to the variables and categories. Um, I didn't include frequencies in there, partly because of the um, issue with weights. So I didn't try to um, provide frequencies, but those are fairly easy to generate. Um, and there's a user guide which talks about how to um, use events in teaching, which um, a lot of this material that's coming up comes from. So. Um, I think the benefits are 
Firstly, it's a topic of substantive interest in many disciplines. So I've taught in both sociology and human geography, and I would have bitten the hand off of having a data set like this to teach with because um, students were interested. It linked into other courses they were using, use it, doing. Um, it connected with substantive topics. So there was a possibility for bringing this into kind of broader discussion. Um, and it offers this comprehensive range of information about ethnic minorities. And the key areas we're kind of offering are on racism, identity, and national belonging, the impact of COVID on health, employment, education, and well-being, and political attitudes and trust. And I think for methodological teaching, it supports descriptive analysis, statistical models, and statistical models, including logistic and linear regression, which are kind of highlighted in the user guide to some extent. Um, and I think the kind of learning outcomes from EVENS are both substantive and methodological. So on the substantive side, it engages with recent data about the real world. So this is a thing that is in our memories. It's not historic um, and it's probably quite close to quite a lot of people. Uh, it links more naturally with other, other modules that students are engaged with um, and in terms of the requirements from QAA it address, addresses curricular inclusion of equality and diversity cross cutting themes and encourages a critical approach to the use of evidence. Um, methodologically I think it it's useful for exercises across the kind of general introductory statistical training in social sciences. Um, it encourages better interpretation of data. And because of the way that this data was collected, it stimulates a focus on thinking about data collection and processing. Um, and my experience, I suppose, with lots of students is they want to go and collect their own data. And there are like, some nice pointers here in thinking about how to do that, rather than asking all the people who you talk to on Saturday nights, but thinking more purposefully about what you're collecting, what it's going to tell you. Um, so the user guide has summary information on the three. So it's got three summary information about the survey, links to materials um, about the general survey, as well as the teaching survey. Um, three, te three sets of teaching guides on the three topics, so race and identity and belonging, health, well-being, and the impact of COVID-19. Um, and each section then looks at research topics and potential research questions, areas to analyze, and shows some sample outputs from the Evans book. So um, a useful way of starting teaching is to replicate what people have produced. Um, it suggests the exploration of some associations between variables, and where appropriate, gives advice on building regression models. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, we use two mental health scales, one on depression, the eight-item depression scale, uh, which I'm going to go over in a bit, and the um, seven-item generalized anxiety and depression scale. Um, so there are some issues before we move into it um, in the way that the, the data set has been put together. So first of all, um, where missing values are there in the main events data set, they've been set as a value category not applicable so that they can be incorporated in models. So there's a number of routing areas within the survey that means there's quite a lot of missing values. So if you, for example, say you've never experienced racism, then you don't get to answer all of those questions. So that group of people who didn't experience racism won't necessarily appear when you go into the subcategories of racism. So what you'll get um, in the teaching data set is not applicable. Um, to reduce the number of variables, uh, I've reduced the specificity of country of birth to um, those that have 30 or more respondents and grouped others together into broader geographical areas. There's still around 50 countries, I think. Um, similarly, with the party people intend to vote for, um, there was quite detailed breakdown in the main data set. That, again, has been reduced. A couple of areas where you might expect to see, you would see in most surveys, um, in terms of occupational social class, we didn't capture enough information on occupation to enable us to apply the methodology to, to develop occupational social class. But there are a couple of potential substitutes. One is highest level of qualification, um, which is pretty detailed, and income, 
um, but that is household income, so it would need to be adapted based on household size. The tenure is just rented or the categories of ownership, um, and I think living rent free, but it doesn't break down private and social renting. Um, and because relationships within the households aren't captured, it's an individual survey, there's limited information about household composition. So you can tell the number of adults and children, broadly speaking, in a house, um, or whether there's adults, one, two, or more than two, and whether there's dependent children. So let's have a look at some of the ideas for teaching. So first of all, there's a set of demographic data here. So at the core of this, I suppose, is ethnicity, religion, region, age, sex, and then you've got a number of other de demographic characteristics. So um, country of birth, year of arrival in the UK, household structure, number of children, number of generations, which is quite interesting, um, household income, length of residence, and highest level of qualification. And you could, for example, look here at how those um, the highest level of qualification vary between ethnic groups. And um, I've cut out the Asian group here. What you can see is, as an Asian group, there is a kind of average um, across the levels, but there are quite significant differences between groups. <clears throat> so when you look at postgraduate degrees, that's quite high for the Indian group. The average is 30. But when you move across to Pakistani, it goes down significantly in Bangladeshi even more. Um, and you can see those kinds of breakdowns. So partly when you're uh, in terms of presenting this here, it's not so easy to present the 21 ethnic groups and this breakdown. So chunking this does one thing, enables to give an example, but it also shows the effect of grouping characteristics. So the higher level ethnic group here has quite a different outcome that doesn't really reflect the diversity between the groups. Um, on racism, identity and belonging, um, we've got experiences of racism, whether we feel part of the country, uh, feeling part of Britain, um, England, Scotland or Wales, feeling British, English, Scottish, Welsh, or people's own ethnic identity. Questions around local belonging and whether that's changed. And that's the kind of defined in the classic way of within 15 minutes, I think, of the area you are living. How you've responded to racism and worry about racism, which um, Lisa's already talked about. And the importance of the ethnic by background and religious background to who you think you are. Um, and in the example, um, how do experiences of racism in the local neighbourhood vary between ethnic groups? And that's what I'm going to show you. And then you might explore how that varies by sex, age, migration, history and region. So this is picking up one of those racism variables and looking at differences. And um, they are quite stark, really. Um, you know, there's a, these are ordered down, but high levels of racism in the neighbourhood for those from any other black background, gypsy traveller, Roma, mixed white and black African, etc. And you might, you know, want to think about why that is, and maybe with some geography that would help to break it down, or whether it's about age or sex. So th there's a number of interesting areas to explore just from that initial um, look at the breakdown. Um, this is a really um, complex set of data, I suppose, from the um, putting it together and trying to group it into things. But it's about health, well-being and the impact of COVID-19. On the, on the left-hand side, we've got um, information about subject, objective health, limiting long-term conditions and access to care. We've got things around COVID. I think one of the kind of key findings in the book was about experiences of bereavement, different, differential experiences of bereavement, but also around uh, attitudes to vaccination, having had COVID, having had tests, and whether people use the app. Economic stroke, employment impact, worrying about money, and those kind of home effects, like how many people or what percentage of time were people spending working for home? What was the impact on caring for their children and schooling at home? How What kind of lifestyle adjustments did people make and those are largely framed in terms of financial impacts i think but it's the implication is because we had less money or because we could do less these are the kind of changes we made and also access to the outdoors which was 
a key factor. So do people have private gardens or private spaces they can go to? Uh, do they have shared spaces in the house they live in or are they reliant on being outdoors? And if they are, are they near to green spaces, parks, etc.? And then the last set of measures around mental health I'm going to go into a little bit more. So looking at this is an example from the book around experiences of COVID-related bereavement. And what we can see is kind of quite big differences between different groups here. Um, so the South Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi um, have higher, and Chinese have higher than um, higher levels or are more likely to have experienced bereavements than the white group, which is a comparator. Similarly for white Irish, gypsy traveler, Jewish. So looking down that list, it does look like there was quite a um, a difference between most ethnic groups and the white British. Um, less so on bereavement of any kind, but still significant patterns. And this is one of those examples where you could replicate this within class using the data and the weight um, from the book. So the, the last section is on um, political attitudes and behaviour. So it's got interest in politics, intention to vote, um, trust in the government handling of COVID-19. And as Lisa said, that's trusting government at different levels. So people are asked whether they trusted the UK government, whether they trusted their um, own government, whether they trusted their local mayor. Um, attitudes to Black Lives Matter and attitudes to and experiences of policing and whether people have taken action in terms of Black Lives Matter. Um, and if we look here, you can see there's quite big regional differences between trust in the UK government um, and ethnic minority groups and white British groups. I suppose maybe a bit surprisingly, ethnic minority groups tend to trust the government more. Um, doesn't reflect my attitudes, but I suppose I'm, I did complete the survey, but I'm probably not um, figuring enough in the waiting to move that along. Um, and then I wanted to talk about these measures of depression and anxiety. Um, so there are two sets of scales. So this scale is a depression scale. It's a standard scale. It asks you these sets of questions. Um, and I used SPSS when I was looking at this. Um, I'm aware that factors operate quite differently in different packages. So this is something you need to experiment with before. But potentially you could generate one factor for all questions, or you could generate a second factor. Or if you're working with students, you could say, let's put these together out. You know, how are we going to put these together and work out how to do that um, with the students? A kind of positive thing I've done, I think, in, in the past. But overall, it gives you a measure of depression, which is relatively well recognized and is used in the Evans book. Um, the next one is slightly more compl complicated. So as over the la last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by these different problems? Um, my screen share stops me seeing the answers at the bottom, but in essence, you derive a score um, based on all of those answers. So you add up the columns and arrive at a single score, which gives you um, generalized anxiety measure. Um, again, a useful thing if you're thinking about how are people feeling, um, potentially, potentially very useful for linear regression. So that's me. If there are any questions now, I'll we can pick those up around the teaching data set or more generally. So, um, as I said, just to reinforce, if you do have um, things you would like to share with us, it would be great and to hear about the experience of this, because if um, the bid for code mark, whatever, is successful, there will be um, a new survey or it's a part of the components of that survey. So to hear how you're using it, maybe the, the kind of edges you brought up against that would be useful to include in the new version would be great material for Lisa to take forward into the into the center if success if the bid is successful okay well we'll st we'll hang around for a while if people still have questions or want to talk but thank you very much for attending hopefully you've got something useful from the session thanks very much everyone enjoy the data set <laughs>